Welcome back to The Real News Network. Again, we're with Katrina Vanden Heuvel, editor and publisher of The Nation. We just talked about whether we can, you consider him a man of the progressive politics, and you said broadly a man of progressive politics. But if you take his foreign policy positions, particularly starting with Israel and, and Gaza, uh, for a long time he didn't say anything, and then when he did, he s didn't really say anything that any American president wouldn't have said. So, and given how critical the Israeli-Palestinian question is to the whole issue of foreign policy in the region, what do you make of him on that, and what's the relationship of the progressive movement in terms of critiquing? You raise a number of good points. First of all, when I said broadly progressive, I was speaking more in the context of the domestic arena, though I do think there is a link between foreign and domestic issues, of course. You know, who are we uh, progressives? There are different progressives. It's not a monolithic group. At the nation, I would be uh, very hesitant to say that we have given Obama a pass on Israel, on Iraq, on issues looming ahead, Afghanistan, or on the whole issue of the, quote, war on terror. We've been very forthright in pushing for far broader policies uh, than just closing Guantanamo or even quick revisions to the abuse of interrogation detention policies. But on the Middle East, our, you know, we believe that this is not just an Obama problem. This is an American political, progressive, democratic, liberal problem that there isn't an independent voice. Obama has not done anything to separate himself from previous administrations. There is cowardice on this issue in our political class. So it will again, perhaps it's this crisis, perhaps it's the understanding that if one doesn't move quickly, the idea of a two-state solution will no longer be a possibility. On Iraq, he campaigned to withdraw and end the occupation. Has the nation been too easy on him? I would disagree. We've had Jeremy Scahill in our own editorials early on arguing that we need a full withdrawal, not just combat troops and leaving a force inside Iraq, which we believe undercuts the real end of occupation. Now, Obama, I think, and again, I don't want to bring it back directly to Obama because I see it as a systemic problem. I think he understands the need to re-engage the world with some humility, and I think that is a first step. Um, and I also, I think he, 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 may, he may find a way, probably not, on this Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which I hate to say early on, admit that it's going to be outside of the boldness he may be willing to take on other issues. But I do think um, he understands that the stake of his, pres that his presidency um, rests on how he re-engages a world. And that's why Afghanistan, in my view, becomes very important, because that could become his war very quickly. If one goes back and looks at Obama's speeches in 2002, 2003, um, and looks at why he opposed the Iraq war, yeah. if you read Brent Snowcroft from, and, and some of those Bush one uh, foreign policy people, very similar positions. They're actually opposed to the war, not because it's illegal or because there's not weapons of mass destruction. It's because it will weaken America's strategic position in the world. And his, his positioning, his foreign policy position, he says himself he finds its roots in Truman, in, in Reagan, he even mentions Reagan sometimes. Um, should we not just acknowledge that's who he is? Absolutely. I mean, I, I mean, think, he says it I over think and over he, though, I do think there is, and I don't want to ascribe too much to the symbolism, but it is more than symbolism, that he is a citizen of the world in terms of how he's lived, who he is, African-American with a Kenyan father, having lived in Indonesia. I don't want to ascribe too much to that. But I do, I do think he is aware that um, there are limits to military power. Is that a realistic, is that an idealistic issue? It's one we can work with. And I think this whole idea of soft power, smart power, you can scoff at the terms, but if there is some supple intelligence at work and an understanding of the failures of Iraq and a willingness to rethink Afghanistan and go for regional diplomacy, I'm not asking for everything. I'm saying let's be pragmatic about who he is, but in that limit of military power understanding, there's also an understanding of the real challenges of the 21st century. How does hyper-militarized foreign policy deal with pandemics we've never seen, with trafficking of nuclear weapons, with global economic instability, with women's human rights degradation? A slew of issues which aren't going to be met by military power. This doesn't mean that you have someone in the White House who will agree with us. 
but it does mean that you can push forward the broader parameters of what we believe and try and influence. But it's going to be, it's, you know, I'm not, I'm not, um, you know, I, I, my, my sense of hope about this moment is not easy grace, cheap grace change. It's that a, we have, for the first time in many years, the possibility that good work can be done that could make some change. Fundamental change, that takes time. In the next segment of our interview, let's talk about change for whom. Please join us again with Katrina Vander Heuvel in the next segment of our interviews. Donate today and receive a new documentary film available to members of the Real News Network. The History of the National Security State with legendary author Gore Vidal. Bonus features of the DVD include an in-depth response to Vidal from ex-CIA analyst Ray McGovern, who served under seven U.S. presidents, an exclusive interview with Colin Powell's former chief of staff Larry Wilkerson, and an insightful interview with oil policy analyst Antonia Juhas. News magazine of the screen. Living glimpses of history in the making. Hollywood and Washington is a symbiotic relationship. They both deal with illusions. Reality doesn't often uh, play much of a part. I think I saw through the myth of the uh, Cold War almost from the beginning. I was a Washington political kid from a political family. Roosevelt first had radio because he had a, this great speaking voice and everyone liked to hear. Truman proceeded to break every arrangement that Roosevelt had set up for a peaceful coexistence. And Truman thought that it would be a good idea. Why not just stay armed all the time? And then he devised the national security state. You've got to go up and swear allegiance to the United States or else you're a commie. I mean, we, were, we had imported fascism. We get Dwight Eisenhower, who said that we have this great military industrial complex. It is a dangerous thing. And he said, this is going to change everything. And the way our country's governed, it's going to change us politically. Along comes Jack Kennedy, who wanted to make his mark, believed in the Cold War. But he said, in this kind of politics, it is the appearance of things that matters. I think everybody should take a sober look at the world about us. The national security state still exists, only it isn't communism anymore, it's terrorism. This is the most serious thing that has happened in the history of the United States. Knowledge is power. We need an honest new system. We need the real news. This is the sort of thing we can build right now without anyone else's permission from the government or from the business community. It's the powers in our hands. If we're not gonna sleepwalk into more wars, we think we need to start with a television news network that won't bow to pressure and has the courage to seek facts. And that means independent economics. And that's why we need you. Make a tax-deductible donation now of at least $10 a month or a one-time give of at least $75. As a thank you for your support, we will send you the new documentary film, The History of the National Security State.